Thank you very much, and um, thank you to the organizers for the invitation to present today. Um, we're going to take a little bit of a shift. One, I don't have anybody to debate, and I don't have any pre-questions uh, to, to ask. And I'm going to be talking to you about cellular immunotherapy um, and work that we've been doing with chimeric antigen receptor modified T cells to treat CLL. Um, these are my disclosures. Um, the, the, myself and members of my team have um, IP interests and in, in patents and in, in licensure of this technology to Novartis that's managed at the University of Pennsylvania and funding you can see here. Um, now, I have a very, very short introduction. I don't think I need to highlight any of this for this audience. Um, while the median survival for all patients with CLL may be reasonable, clearly it's quite variable and heterogene um, heterogeneous. There's been tremendous progress made on the ability to determine somebody's prognosis at the time of diagnosis. Regardless of that, I don't think there's any argument that patients with multiply relapsed or refractory CLL or patients with high-risk features, which we've seen a lot about this morning, um, have a very, very poor prognosis. CLL in general is, is thought to be incurable with anything but an allogeneic stem cell transplant, which is associated with extensive morbidity and mortality. And this whole, this, this, this whole meeting is about the need for newer and more effective therapies for advanced and high-risk patients. Um, this is a slide from Michael Keating, and again, I think most people have seen something like this, just showing you the dismal outcome once patients become resistant or refractory to purine analogs or alkylating agents. So this then really is the rationale for cellular therapy and in fact for targeted cellular therapy. I believe that ultimately this has the potential to overcome many of the limitations from conventional chemotherapy and in fact from conventional immune therapy that we've been hearing about. And the use of genetically modified autologous T cells with redirected specificity to tumor specific antigens has the ability to combine the advantages of some of these modalities we've heard about. Like antibody therapy, it will provide specificity since it is targeted through antibody-directed mechanisms. This is cellular therapy, and it is a living drug, and it has the ability to grow and proliferate in the body, which, which then amplifies and magnifies any potential response. And like vaccine therapy, if these cells survive and persist over time, it can provide memory activity. We have chosen to start with targeting CD19, as have many groups. CD19 turns out to be an ideal tumor target. The expression is restricted primarily to B cells and perhaps a small subset of, subset of other lymphoid cells. It is not expressed on a pluripotent bone marrow stem cell, and importantly, it's expressed on the surface of most B cell malignancies. Um, it was known for a number of years that antibodies against CD19 can inhibit growth of tumor cells. And you just see in this cartoon here um, acquisition of CD19 after the stem cell phase um, and is lost uh, usually at differentiation to plasma cells. So what I'm going to talk to you about is work we've been doing targeting leukemia cells with chimeric antigen receptor modified T cells. Now, a CAR or a chimeric antigen receptor combines an antigen recognition domain of an antibody with an intracellular signaling domain into one single chimeric protein. And using efficient gene transfer technology, and in our um, case at University of Pennsylvania, using a lentivirus vector, we can stably express this car in the surface of a T cell, conferring novel antigen specificity. So if you just look at the cartoon here, we use this lentivirus to infect a, a, a normal T cell that directs expression of these chimeric antigen receptors that are, that are then stably expressed on the surface of the T cell. This then allows the T cell to recognize the target antigen, in this case CD19, resulting in killing of the tumor cell. Part of this technology is dependent on having an efficient gene transfer technology. We use a lentivirus. Um, typically, we get uh, efficient transfer in 25 to 40 percent of the T cells. We call these cells either CART-19 um, or, or um, really uh, our newer terminology is CTL-019. 
The signaling domain in this car turns out to be critically important for maximal activation, for expansion of these cells in vivo, and for long-term persistence. I'm not going to go through really um, very much of this preclinical work, but in work uh, really led by Carl June's laboratory over the better part of, of a decade, um, it's been worked out that the signaling domain is important, and the 41BB fragment of CD137 signaling molecule turns out to be, um, uh, in our hands anyhow, one of the more potent signaling domains. When compared with, with CD28, uh, 41BB uh, also um, uh, results in very potent anti-leukemic effects in preclinical murine models against a very aggressive ALL, a NOM6 model. Against primary BALL cells, 41BB turned out to be more potent than CD28, um, and using allogeneic cells in three different xenograft models, 41BB was still more potent. And it not only confers antigen-dependent, but also antigen-independent survival signals to the, to the T cell, making it really um, quite attractive uh, to use in this model. So, what I'm going to do, I can actually give you a little bit of a, a recent update on the first 30 patients with CLL that we've treated with our CARS. You see our CARS meeting CLL. Um, in general, this is a very advanced group of patients. Um, 11 of the 30 have deletion of chromosome 17P. They've had a median of four prior regimens um, with a range of about 1 to 10. And hopefully that's what we end up with, our CARS without CLL, of course. Now, the general scheme of the clinical trials that we're doing is outlined here. Um, it starts at number one in the upper left panel. Um, patients undergo leukophoresis for collection of autologous T cells. They're brought to the lab where they're infected with the lentivirus vector directing expression of, of the anti-CD19 CAR. These cells are grown in culture for about 10 to 12 days by exposure to um, uh, anti-CD3, CD28 magnetic beads. The beads are removed, leaving expanded cell product. That whole process takes about two to two and a half weeks. And then we're left in the upper right-hand panel with our genetically modified T cells. All patients receive um, a course of lymphodepleting chemotherapy. In general, this is defined as a typical regimen that one might use for a CLL patient. Um, in our initial trials, we've left it somewhat open and dependent on a patient's prior therapy and, and toxicity. Once they get lymphodepleting chemotherapy, four days later, they get an infusion of the genetically modified T cells. This is a single center pilot trial um, that I'm going to show you. The primary objectives initially were safety and feasibility, but we've moved on to a second trial. You can find detail inclusion exclusion criteria at clinicaltrials.gov. But basically, we tried to identify characteristics that would select a group of patients that had a limited prognosis, and we estimated less than two years with currently available therapy. Patients had to either um, decline or not be eligible or appropriate for transplant. In our first trial, in our first pilot trial, it was designed to include 14 patients. There were 12 men and two women with a typical median age of 66. They had a median of four prior therapies, but many were even more heavily pretreated. Six of the 14 had deletion of, of uh, p53 gene. For lymphodepleting chemotherapy, six patients received standard bendamustine, five received pentastatin and cytoxin, and three received FC. Rituxin was not given. And this is really just the, to show you the outcome of these first 14 patients. Four of these 14 patients have achieved a complete remission. Um, these are really quite dramatic. Um, they have absolutely no evidence of CLL in the blood, the bone marrow, and all adenopathy is resolved. Um, all four patients have been tested for MRD using deep sequencing, and all are MRD negative. And you can see now our longest follow-up is beyond three years in our, our first two patients treated, and follow-up in all these patients is beyond a year. Um, another four patients have achieved partial responses. Now, several of these partial responses really are quite dramatic. If you look at the, the patient 12 and 22, both these patients had very, very bulky adenopathy. They've had complete clearance of all CLL from the blood and bone marrow. Um, their adenopathy has not completely resolved and therefore are partial responders. Um, but we have seen in, in these patients and two of the earlier patients, the adenopathy continued to improve over time, taking up to a year uh, to completely resolve. 
Now, of course, this hasn't worked for everybody to, to of course, our, our disappointment, um, but there are um, uh, another six patients who have had no response. Now, one of the things you can see highlighted in, 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 um, under the expansion column, patients who respond have had really, really um, a dramatic expansion of the T cells, um, typically over three log expansion of the T cells we infuse. Patients with a PR had a little less expansion, about two logs. And patients who didn't respond were typically less than two logs or didn't, didn't um, expand and the cells didn't survive at all. If you just reorganize this table to responders and non-responders, we have looked very hard trying to identify both clinical and biologic characteristics. Who might, um, that might define who may or may not respond, um, and we haven't been able to do it. The only thing that correlates with response is that, that when the T cells expand to high levels, patients um, respond when they don't, they don't respond. It is not age, it's not prior therapy, it's not P53, it's not cell dose, importantly, which I will show you a little bit more data. Um, and so far, there's no biological characteristic um, that we've been able to identify, though continue to look very hard. Um, I didn't show you the cell doses that we gave these patients, but th there was um, uh, over a two and a half log variability in the cell dose. It did not seem to be dose dependent. And moving forward, um, it was very important that we define either the importance or, or lack of importance of cell dose for future trials. So we then opened up and are in the middle of performing a dose optimization study. This is actually a randomized phase two trial between dose, uh, two dose levels, a dose that was the median dose level we used on our pilot study and a dose that was at the high dose level we used on our pilot study. Um, we, so far, um, while we've enrolled 21 patients, I can give you a little update on the first 16 that have follow-up beyond one month. The, the, the primary endpoint, remembering, is that, that CR is at three months in this study because we have seen continued responses over time. Um, there were, tw there, there so far have been 12 men and, and four women in this group of 16. Again, a median of four prior therapies. 42% had a deletion of P53. <coughs> and this is just showing you the outcomes. Um, three of these patients so far have had a complete remission in the bright yellow. Another three have had a partial response um, in, the, in, in the light yellow. Um, again, all of these patients in complete remission have no evidence of disease in any compartment. Um, uh, and um, furthermore, um, at least in the first two with follow-up at um, uh, three months were MRD negative. Um, the other thing to, to notice is that it didn't matter whether they received our higher dose or our lower dose. If you put these 16 patients together with the first 14 I showed you, we, we have some data now on 30 patients. Seven have had a complete response. Um, seven have had a partial response. Many of these, these very major responses. And therefore, 14 out of the 30 patients, we, we believe, have had these very, very clinically meaningful um, responses for a total of 47% of the group. Um, now, I told you this, these patients were MRD negative. This is just highlighting this in one of our earlier patients by deep sequencing, um, showing at, at the initiation of therapy, the vast majority of B cell signals were from the um, CLL clone. And already by day 31, there's no evidence of any B cell clone. And this was sustained out to about two years when last tested. Um, these cells persist over long periods of time. Um, this is showing you a patient at one year of all the CD3 positive cells, still 14% of these cells were CAR modified T cells. It was lower by 15 months at 3%, a little over 1% at 18 months, still detectable at three years though at low levels. And as a proof of mechanism that these cells are continuously active and they're not senescent, um, these patients do develop as a on-target side effect B-cell aplasia that persists as long as these cells have been detectable. Now, this hasn't been without toxicity. Um, the infusion of the cells has been uneventful. Um, several patients have developed both hepato and renal toxicity that's been reversible. This is generally related to either a tumor lysis syndrome that can be delayed or um, occurs during a cytokine release syndrome. I just showed you that these patients develop B-cell aplasia and hypogammaglobulinemia. We are supporting them with IVIG. 
Um, tumor lysis syndromes have been delayed and coincident with the, the um, expansion of the T cells. The cytokine release syndrome that occurs, though, has really been quite consistent and, and can be, in fact, very dramatic. Um, all of our responding patients have developed this CRS manifested by high, somewhat unrelenting fevers, myalgias, arthralgias, nausea, and ultimately evolving over a number of days to potentially developing hypotension and hypoxia with a capillary leak. Very early on, um, Mike uh, Kalos's lab at University of Pennsylvania um, is doing a lot of the biological assessments for this study and noted that IL-6 levels were remarkably high and out of proportion to other cytokines. Interferon gamma, TNF alpha were only modestly elevated. Um, IL-2 really was not particularly elevated. Um, and that led us, after we treated the first patient with a cytokine release syndrome with steroids with modest benefit, um, the next group of patients all have been receiving an anti-IL-6 receptor antibody tocilizumab. It results in, in remarkable responses, almost instantaneous in most patients. Um, we've had to treat patients somewhere between two to 10 days after developing their cytokine release syndrome. We now know that, that we have an effective anti-cytokine therapy to abrogate the response or, or, or to, to, to stop this, this syndrome. What we don't know if intervening with patients um, will abrogate the T-cell response. Um, and, and that's something we're trying to learn in, in future studies. In addition, the cytokine release syndrome has been associated with a clinical syndrome very uh, much like HLH, or, or really what I prefer to call a macrophage activation syndrome. We can identify hemophagocytosis histologically. They have hemolysis, DIC, seen very remarkable elevations in ferritins, as high as 600,000, in fact. Some of these patients um, uh, can develop um, uh, uh, lethargy and confusion that you see with HLH. This is just showing you a patient in the midst of their cytokine release syndrome with a ferritin that peaked at 600,000. You see they received tocilizumab anti-IL-6 therapy. Um, they were persistently febrile with 104, 105 degree fevers that resolved within hours. We've seen hypotension improve within an hour, um, and then things normalize. And there's the fever curve on the same patient, just the, these high spiking fevers that just completely resolved. All of this is now very preliminary. Our follow-up is short. Um, but at least in this group of patients, as yet, we don't have any suggestion that there's a dose response or a dose toxicity relationship. And I'm not going to go through all the, the permutations of high dose and low dose who's responded. It's, it's almost the same. We see the same response and toxicity regardless of dose. That, that is not particularly surprising to me. I think it has much more to do with how many cells these patients end up with rather than how many cells we give them initially. As I mentioned, um, <clears throat> we've looked very hard for factors that might determine who will and who won't respond. Um, the only thing we've identified, which is not predictable, is whether or not patients have T cell expansion. Um, all of our responding patients have developed a cytokine release syndrome coincident with T cell expansion. Um, things that as, as yet have not fallen out, but again, this is the, the curse of small numbers, of course. The patterns are not yet evident. Um, it, it, we haven't identified any relationship to the pre-infusion um, T cell activity that we can test for the CD8 function, the post-expansion CD8 function. Um, we've looked at the cytokine profile. We've looked at patient characteristics, um, uh, risk markers, disease characteristics, and as yet we cannot predict um, why somebody may or may not respond, though again, there's a lot of work ongoing that I hope in the next six months or a year um, uh, we'll be able to talk more intelligently about. Um, so um, some of this I've showed you the actual data and some I've just um, implied, but when these cells expand, it really can be quite massive between 1,000 to 10,000 fold in vivo. We've now identified long-term persistence of these cells, and we believe we have evidence for continued biological activity beyond 36 months. We've been able to collect some of these cells from a patient at one year, at least, and show that they were biologically active. All responding patients have developed the cytokine release syndrome, but, but we, we do believe we have an effective intervention. We don't know if that's going to inhibit the response. And as yet, as I mentioned, we don't have any, any evidence for a dose response or dose toxicity relationship. 
all of our patients have developed um, B cell aplasia, um, it really is quite remarkable. With this expansion, for every cell that we infuse, we've calculated, we've been able um, to, to um, induce tumor killing between uh, an effective target, effector target ratio of 1 to 1,000 to 1 to 93,000. Um, our overall response rate in CLL is 47 percent, and again, I just emphasize that many of these PRs are, are still ongoing. And importantly, um, no patient with a CR has yet relapsed, um, and no patient with one of our major um, uh, PRs with clearance of their blood and marrow has relapsed. And so, so I really do believe CAR therapy is going to hold great promise for these patients with CLL, um, and hopefully as we move forward with other hematologic malignancies. Um, these are perhaps my most important slides. Um, allow me, this, this is actually a, a photo I took on the um, entrance to um, Fantasyland at the Magic Kingdom, um, a quote from Walt Disney that I found very apropos. Whatever we accomplish belongs to our entire group, a tribute to our combined effort. And um, so I show you the short list of the people who have really contributed to this. All this work was led um, uh, for the better part of a decade by Carl June in his lab. Um, our cell vaccine production facility makes these cells for us right now, led by Bruce Levine. Michael Collis's lab um, uh, runs our, Michael Collis runs our translational uh, uh, and correlative science lab who's done all the biological assessments and um, you see the names of all the other people um, who have participated in our um, funders. So thank you very much and may or may not have time for questions.